Good afternoon. Uh, it's my pleasure to welcome you all to the afternoon session. And this session was organized by UFAS, by the European Federation of Addiction Societies. I'm Marcin Wojnar, uh, a psychiatrist from the Medical University of Warsaw in Poland. And I have a pleasure to co-chair this session with Professor Colin Drummond, addiction psychiatrist from King's College in London. Uh, first, we would like to introduce UFAS, the European Federation of Addiction Societies, and I would like to ask Benjamin Roland, professor of addictology from the University of Lyon in France, to tell us exactly what is UFAS. Benjamin, please. Hello, everyone. Thank you very much, Marcin. Uh, I'm going to talk in French, or because we are, I've supposed that the audience was, would be French in, in majority. But of course, we can exchange in English after that. So, donc, je vais parler français pour présenter le FAS pour le public français. Donc le FAS, c'est la Fédération européenne des sociétés d'addictologie. Euh, elle regroupe des sociétés médicales. En France, euh, c'est essentiellement... Euh, sont, les addictologues sont des médecins, mais ailleurs en Europe, il y a aussi des addictologues psychologues. Hein, et donc, il existe des euh, sociétés nationales euh, d'addictologie psychologique. Ça paraît bizarre de dire ça en français, mais euh, c'est le cas euh, dans d'autres pays européens. Et donc, vous voyez ici sur la carte, la carte n'est pas à jour, d'abord parce qu'elle n'est pas à jour sur notre site internet et on va bientôt la mettre à jour. Euh, mais vous voyez que de nombreux pays ont des associations euh, de médecine, euh, d'addictologie euh, ou de, de psychologie qui appartiennent à l'EFAS. Euh, deux euh, se sont ajoutés euh, ce matin, euh, la Slovaquie et la Turquie. Voilà. Euh, donc c'est euh, une vision large de l'Europe, hein, ce n'est pas l'Union européenne, c'est euh, l'Europe continent qui euh, regroupe euh, toutes ces, euh, ces sociétés euh, qui, qui euh, appartiennent ou vont appartenir à, à l'EFAS. Et donc euh, les pays sont représentés au sein du comité exécutif euh, de l'EFAS et euh, ce matin nous avons eu notre assemblée générale pour discuter de, de plusieurs points dont, dont certains vont être abordés dans cette courte présentation. Donc les principales missions de l'EFAS, vous les avez là résumées, euh, c'est d'abord de discuter, d'échanger, peut-être mes collègues seront, euh, auront un point de vue sensiblement différent, mais l'EFAS est avant tout un, un think tank, un endroit où on, on essaie d'identifier euh, la façon dont euh, les problématiques d'addictologie se posent en Europe, les différences, euh, l'hétérogénéité euh, des, des prises en charge, de la formation, euh, de la recherche, et d'essayer de voir pourquoi il y a cette hétérogénéité, quelle est sa richesse, quels problèmes ça pose et comment éventuellement remédier aux problèmes qui sont, qui sont posés. Le FAS, donc, l'une de ses missions principales à terme, c'est d'améliorer la prise en charge des, des patients atteints d'addiction dans tous les pays européens, d'améliorer aussi la prévention, d'essayer de mieux structurer et fédérer les initiatives de recherche et de formation au niveau européen, et Jorgen Bramnes parlera d'une enquête qu'il a pilotée et publiée dans European Addiction Research, donc le, le journal rattaché à, à l'EFAS sur les, les modalités de, de graduation, de diplôme et de euh, formation en addictologie à travers euh, l'Europe. Euh, L'EFAS a des liens avec différentes sociétés européennes, la principale, c'est pas la seule, mais la principale étant la, société, la, la Fédération Européenne de Psychiatrie, donc l'EPA, et l'ancien le, le, président, un des anciens présidents de, de l'EFAS, c'est maintenant président de, de l'EPA, c'est le professeur Dom qui est absent euh, aujourd'hui. Voilà, et euh, même si ça fait partie des missions, pour l'instant, euh, euh, c'est peu fait, mais ça fait partie du, de, des missions futures, euh, c'est de faire du lobbying, notamment auprès des pouvoirs européens, pour mieux faire entendre, et mieux fédérer, mieux structurer la voie euh, des problématiques addictives et, et de, des, des professionnels du champ des addictions, euh, auprès des, euh, des instances européennes et des instances nationales. 
nos partenariats dont je le disais, peut-être l'une des principales, les deux principales, c'est avec euh, l'EPA, donc la European Psychiatric Association, et puis l'IMCDDA aussi que vous connaissez, hein, qui est l'équivalent de l'OFDT, mais européen, ou plutôt l'OFDT, la branche française de l'IMCDDA. Et donc, euh, à chaque congrès de l'EPA et de l'IMCDDA, le FAS est présent et euh, par, organise des sessions euh, conjointes avec ces, ces organismes euh, lors, de, lors de leur congrès. On a d'autres partenariats aussi, notamment avec l'ESBRA, que certains d'entre vous connaissent, qui est euh, la, la Société européenne de recherche euh, en matière d'alcool, donc plutôt fondamentale, hein, mais euh, certains d'entre nous euh, euh, sont aussi membres de, de l'ESBRA. Et puis l'ISAM, qui est la Société euh, internationale d'addictologie, de, de médecine addictologique. Voilà, il y a d'autres partenariats qui sont en train de se mettre en place avec euh, l'OMS et avec euh, d'autres euh, sociétés spécialisées comme des sociétés de la douleur par exemple, les liens avec l'addictologie sont évidents. Le FAS publie, euh, comme je le disais, des, euh, des données et des euh, papiers de réflexion, euh, notamment il y a des publications très régulières euh, d'enquêtes de, européennes sur différents sujets. Il y a eu des publications sur la recherche en Europe en matière d'addictologie, Jorgen Bramnes, encore une fois, va parler de, de la publication la plus récente sur euh, le, la formation euh, et le, les diplômes d'addictologie à travers euh, l'Europe. Donc, euh, ben, régulièrement, euh, des questions pan-européennes sont, sont, sont traitées, sont abordées. Et euh, les, dans les projets futurs, il y a certains sujets qui ont émergé ce matin, comme les traitements de substitution, euh, parce qu'il y a une grande hétérogénéité des pratiques et de l'accès euh, au traitement de substitution et Honor Englander va en parler pour faire un parallèle France-États-Unis euh, dans sa présentation. Et puis euh, d'autres sujets comme l'accès au public jeune, par exemple, euh, ont été évoqués ce matin comme euh, futurs projets d'enquête de, euh, européenne euh, par le FAS. Je le disais, on est présent donc au, au congrès de nos partenaires. Le FAS n'a pas de congrès spécifique, mais s'associe euh, à des congrès. Euh, Aujourd'hui, on est un exemple et on remercie encore une fois très vivement ATHS de son accueil euh, et de cette session EFAS à ATHS. Mais nous sommes présents dans des congrès européens, je l'ai dit, Lisbonne Addiction, donc, qui est le congrès de l'IMCDDA, euh, les, les congrès annuels de l'EPA et puis donc l'ESBRA et, et, et d'autres congrès plus nationaux euh, qui accueillent régulièrement euh, le FAS. Le FAS attribue aussi, en partenariat avec son journal de rattachement European Addiction Research, un prix de, du grand scientifique européen. Donc jusqu'à présent, c'était un prix annuel. C'est un prix qui récompense une carrière. Hein. C'est un prix donc, euh, sur les travaux passés. Hein. Et donc vous voyez ici tous les lauréats euh, de, de ces prix depuis euh, 2016. On va probablement passer à, à un format biannuel pour, euh, enfin, tous les deux ans, excusez-moi, pour, pour différentes raisons. Et donc, vous retrouvez ici euh, des noms euh, très connus du, du champ euh, addictologique. Donc, ça, c'est un, un partenariat avec euh, European Addiction Research aussi, qui vise à, à, voilà, à récompenser un chercheur européen du champ clinique euh, pour euh, tout ce qu'il a accompli et tout ce qu'il a apporté, à la fois sur le plan scientifique, sur le plan clinique et puis sur le plan politique. Euh, à travers les, les travaux qu'il a, qu a réalisés durant sa carrière. Euh, le FAS est aussi impliqué dans des projets européens soutenus par l'Union européenne. Le dernier en, en, exemple en date était Phoenix. Donc Phoenix, c'est un projet consortium hein, autour de la réduction des risques euh, en Europe. Et donc euh, Phoenix était porté euh, plutôt par des euh, associations et, et des euh, universités impliquées dans le champ de la réduction des risques. Et euh, le but de Phoenix, c'était d'essayer d'identifier euh, les principaux euh, euh, projets euh, innovants et, et porteurs de qualité euh, en matière de réduction des risques, euh, de les décrire, de les euh, récompenser, de les mettre en valeur auprès de l'Union européenne. Donc euh, c'était un, un travail un peu de, de mise en valeur euh, des initiatives pour que l'Union européenne puisse euh, identifier quels sont les, les euh, projets les plus originaux ces dernières années qui ont, qui ont émergé dans le champ de, de la réduction des risques. Et donc, euh, le FAS était un partenaire naturel avec beaucoup d'autres partenaires européens euh, de cette initiative Phoenix qui vient d'être terminée et donc le rapport final vient d'être rendu à, à l'Europe et il y aura des publications scientifiques à la clé. Voilà, nous avons un site internet que je vous invite à consulter. On a aussi un compte Twitter ou X euh, que, que, auquel vous pouvez vous, vous abonner hein, et qui diffuse régulièrement des nouvelles euh, sur la vie de euh, le FAS et des différentes sociétés qui, euh, qui y sont euh, rattachées. Et puis, euh, comme je le disais, donc on a euh, 
ce partenariat avec le journal European Addiction Research. Et si vous êtes lecteur de European Addiction Research, désormais, à partir du mois prochain, il y aura une page dans chaque euh, volume de European Addiction Research, il y aura une page consacrée à la vie de, de l'EFAS. Et la première page euh, de l'EFAS va être consacrée à, à ce qui s'est tenu aujourd'hui, donc ici à ATHS, euh, pour parler du Congrès qui nous a hébergé. Et c'est une forme de reconnaissance pour le Congrès, mais aussi pour dire euh, tout ce qui a été discuté, notamment, notamment à notre Assemblée Générale, euh, qui a eu lieu ce matin. Voilà, je vous présente, donc, c'était l'ancien comité exécutif, puisqu'il a changé, je n'ai pas eu le temps de, de changer, mais il a changé à la marge, et notamment euh, les, les personnes impliquées avec des rôles, donc euh, notre président qui reste président, le professeur de Remon, euh, Jorgen Bramnes qui est le, le vice-président, moi-même comme secrétaire général, et puis tout le, le, le bureau, euh, c'est l'ancien bureau, mais il a changé aussi à la marge, on a Cristina Ribeiro aussi qui est vice-présidente maintenant de, du Portugal, voilà, et un, un remerciement particulier pour Karen Herche, qui est la, donc la chief éditrice de European Addition Research et qui est très impliquée euh, dans, dans le FAS. Voilà. Merci beaucoup. Thank you very much, Benjamin. Uh, we'll keep the time for questions to, at the end of the session. And now I have a very big pleasure to invite to the stage Jürgen Bramnes, who is the addiction psychiatrist, professor of addiction medicine, previously from the University of Oslo and now from the Arctic University of Norway in Tromsø. And uh, he will present uh, a part of the work done by, by UFAS about the addiction training across Europe. Uh, thank you, Martin, so much. Um, I'm going to speak in English, but uh, I have had help from my good friend Benjamin Wola to translate uh, the slides into, uh, into French. Uh, now, I have corrected some of my own statements uh, after they were translated, so those of you who know both languages may react to some things, but uh, I think that's okay. Um, I'm going to present uh, results from a uh, a survey we did amongst uh, all our colleagues in, or, or our member societies in uh, the UFAS uh, on addiction training uh, in uh, medicine and psychology across Europe. And uh, this was done by a lot of collaborators. Uh, you see them listed all here, many from the, most of people then tightly involved in the UFAS organization. And this is a publication that is uh, online now, but will be printed in a very uh, shortly upcoming uh, issue of European Addiction Research. So it's available now online for those, and, and free of charge, full text for everybody. Uh, Benjamin has already um, taken you through all this <clears throat> previously in his uh, good lecture, but. Uh, I want to emphasize some of the missions for the UFAS as a society uh, or as an organization because they are core to why we wanted to do such uh, uh, a survey and look into what is uh, the situation for training amongst the addiction psychologists and addiction medical uh, doctors in, in Europe. It has to do with uh, the core missions and aims of UFAS that we should improve the care for these patients we should improve prevention, we should look into treatment systems, we should address the different uh, financial resources allocated to the field. We want to do something uh, uh, on reinforcing addiction research. We want to improve and harmonize prevention and treatment. And one core thing in such a, a task or mission would be to look into what are people taught in their uh, training uh, to become addiction psychologists and addiction uh, uh, doctors. And also maybe this will come out of this paper when it's published, is that we may suggest policies in the educational area to improve uh, the harmonization of, uh, of um, uh, education across Europe this is also important because there is a lot of traveling now between different European countries within the Union and also for Norway who is still outside the Union. 
uh, but we have collaborations across uh, the countries and, and harmonizing our ways of addressing this field would be of importance. <clears throat> so I've said some of this already, but these are the foundations of why do this survey, because addiction training is needed. Uh, there are relatively new fields, addiction psychology and addiction medicine, uh, in the field of clinical practice, at least in some countries. Other countries have a longer tradition, but it, it's a fairly new medical and psychological speciality. And there is a great, and we know this from talking to colleagues across Europe, a great variety in the background and training of the different uh, specialists in uh, addiction medicine and addiction psychology. So uh, this is maybe a problem, and we wanted to look into that. And maybe is there a basis for a unified sort of uh, European education within these fields? And maybe such a survey could give at least some basis for answering these questions. Also, looking outside the education, looking into the sort of reality this education plays out in, it is uh, important to say that a lot of the treatment are given by non-governmental organizations, be it idealistic uh, uh, private uh, or even commercial private uh, deliverers. And this may also be a challenge when coming to standardizing what is given as treatment for patients. And we must admit that in the past at least, and unfortunately still in some places, ideology, morality, and religion still are very present rather than evidence-based treatment. So, so a good educational uh, background is, I think, a basis for changing this that in some cases is not optimal. And it is true, uh, and still is true in most countries, and, and still I think, that other professions than psychologists and medical doctors have dominated the field, but there is an increasing use of our professions also within this field, and I think we need to be sure of some of the educational basis for uh, these specialists uh, amongst us. Now, how did we do this? We wanted to do a survey looking at uh, all aspects, or many, as many aspects as possible um, across Europe, and obviously it's a difficult task. We sent out uh, questionnaires to, we had 34 member societies within the UFAS, and uh, they were sent out there in 24 different countries, and we asked if they could forward these things because not everybody was in the position that they could answer these questions, even though not very complex. There was one arm for the psychology and one arm for the medical part of the survey. And what we did when we got responses from uh, the different countries and, and member organizations, we, we fed it back. We organized the data they had given us and fed it back to the organization so that they could give us feedback. Uh, before designing the survey, we had a so-called Delphi process. That's a process where we are putting up suggestions and putting it into a feedback loop. And uh, uh, the experts that are amongst uh, the co-authors of this paper were asked, is this a good way to ask? Should we ask it differently? And we, there's a whole process that is quite formalized that was, uh, uh, that was on the basis for how developing this survey. And this is generally how we do surveys when we have a process of doing surveys within the UFAS. Uh, the expert group consisted of 14, addic 14 addiction clinicians and researchers from 10 European countries, and the countries are named here. And the process went, uh, the survey was, was out there from April to August 2021, so already it's gone two years. Tells you a bit about the process of uh, producing such a survey and, and, and managing the results. And as I said, the replies and our interpretation of, interpretation of these replies were fed back and revised by each of the responders. So in order to try at least to, to qualitatively uh, uh, or qualify the, the, the data given in our interpretation of them. Now I'm going to give you a lot of graphs and a lot of uh, figures here, but uh, uh, hopefully it will illustrate some of the, of the things that uh, we covered in the survey. Now this is a graph showing the length of the training in addiction medicine across Europe. And the blue columns are full, t uh, are, are, um, uh, 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 yes, uh, uh, 
in some countries it varied between a minimal uh, amount of time uh, needed to be uh, considered an addiction doctor and they had a maximum time. So for example, in the first country, Austria, you could make do with six months, but the maximum training was uh, 48 months. And uh, it went from countries having very few weeks, like you see Germany here has uh, uh, two to think two week course in addiction medicine that qualifies people to become addiction specialists. That's the formal training while the formal training in the country that had the most was, uh, was Norway, where we have uh, five years of addiction medicine training to become a specialist. So it varies quite a lot across different countries. And as you see, some countries do not have formal addiction training, uh, medicine training. That's countries like Italy, Lithuania, Luxembourg, and Poland. Then there is a variation in who approves uh, different specialists, and this has uh, maybe a lot to do with how uh, healthcare system uh, is um, organized in different countries. And you see that in six countries, the government approved the specialists. In six countries, professional societies approved the specialists. In four countries, universities um, uh, uh, approved the specialists. And in eight countries, then there were no specialties approvals, specialist approvals. Now you could look at the number of addiction specialists in real-time figures. You see the, the graph on the left here where you see that Germany has really the highest number of addiction specialists. You might relate that to the short courses that are given uh, to become an addiction specialist. But maybe more interesting on the map there, you will see the number of addiction specialists, uh, uh, the relative numbers, that's per inhabitant uh, uh, in the countries, where you see still Germany is very high, but Finland, Norway, France, uh, and um, um, Austria, no, yes, come up quite high as well. Sorry for the geography there. Um, now, what did, uh, what did it contain? Uh, it, it is, uh, we, we ask people what are they involved in when they, when they do this training. Is it theoretical learning? Is it clinical supervision? Do they do tutorials, practical courses? Uh, do, are they educated in non-pharmacological interventions, in pharmacotherapy, different procedures, medical emergencies, complications, and dual diagnosis? And as you see here, most uh, countries that had a specialty trained the, the, the doctors in all of these fields with some differences. And these are marked in the, in the lower hair. You can read, it's probably not easy to see, but um, the two yellow ones in the middle there are in fact uh, courses that uh, are given to doctors not putting out a specialty even. So some countries will have training even if they don't have an official specialty. One other way to approach this is to look what is the academic staff that provides this training and what, what is the position of, the, of, of addiction medicine in, in academia and are there professorships. And here I've divided into part-time and full-time professorships, uh, the part-time ones being the orange columns. And you see there is a great variety with France absolutely leading the course with I think uh, at that time it was 23 full-time professorships in, in addiction medicine, which is uh, beyond uh, doubt the, the, the most uh, in Europe. Well, you see a country like Croatia has quite a few uh, part-time uh, professorships and then United Kingdom in third place. And then we've moved to training in addiction psychology. Uh, here we got much less answers. This may be a fault of ours, but I think also it, and to some extent it reflects that addiction psychology is not that um, well distributed in, across Europe. So uh, here we only got a response from a, a smaller number of countries. And the, the two countries that had the longest uh, uh, education for addiction psychology were Sweden and Croatia with uh, a full five years educational run. And then you see that other countries follow either by having uh, uh, some can have a, a longer education, but the required education is lower, ranging from uh, six months, half a year to up to two years for the lower ones. And quite a few countries not having specialty in addiction psychology. Also here, government, professional societies, universities, 
will approve the psychologists differentiating more or less along the same lines as you would see for the addiction medical or addiction doctors. <clears throat> now, the number of addiction psychologists specialists in different countries where we got response, and I know these responses are not complete because I know there are countries that didn't respond to this, but uh, after having sent numerous emails, we gave up, and these are the numbers we see on addiction specialists in psychology field from, from some of the countries we got responses from. Uh, likewise, as I presented for the medical profession, uh, also in psychology, there are uh, professorships uh, when we look into the academic side. And here, Croatia, who had many addiction psychologists, also have many addiction professor, uh, psychology professorships. And uh, also Germany, quite a few, uh, at least part-time, and Austria, quite a few, also part-time. These are probably people who either hold a clinical position or divide their work between addiction psychology and other parts of academic psychology. Now, a summary of all this, and here you see the paper as it will look. This is my copy, it's as a free author copy, so I'm not sure if I'm allowed to show it so you can blink. But uh, 16 of 24 countries had some sort of addiction medical training with a median 24 months as uh, their training period, but a wide range, as you saw. 16, uh, seven of the 16 countries where we got uh, some feedback from uh, had addiction psychology training, and it also here had a wide range, ranging from two to five years of training. Now, the content of the education varied, but most countries covered all the fields that we asked for, and tutorials and interactive learning and medical emergencies were the fields that were mostly lacking and that where there is room for improvement. Now, the number of addiction specialists varied greatly across different European countries, and this has obviously something to do with what is the definition of an addiction specialist in the different countries. And here we have a long way to go to harmonize any uh, inter-European collaboration because an addiction specialist will mean one thing in one country and another thing in another country. And hopefully we can start there and have some work done on, uh, on uh, uh, harmonizing rules across Europe. And certifications were given from different kinds of institutions. And this may also be some of the problem that we need to address if we want to go further and try to do something in the way of harmonization of education within addiction psychology or addiction medicine in Europe. So with that, thank you. Thank you, Jürgen. And now, I would like to <clears throat> invite to the stage a uh, professor of medicine, internal medicine and addiction medicine, who came to us from the United States, uh, Honora Englander. Honora is a professor at the <clears throat> University of Health and Sciences in Portland, Oregon, but now, for a year, she's visiting, has a professional visit at the University of Lyon. So she is partly from France at the moment. And Honora will share with us uh, uh, her uh, study on comparing systems of access to opioid substitution treatment between France and United States. Bonjour à tous et à toutes, uh, et je vous remercie de me donner l'opportunité de m'adresser à vous uh, aujourd'hui. Um, I'm going to shift and speak in English because I'll be more comfortable, but uh, again, thank you so much for the opportunity. Perhaps in a few months I can do this in, in French. Uh, so today I'll be speaking about comparing methadone and buprenorphine care systems between the U.S. and France. Uh, and I do want to acknowledge the funding for this work, which comes from the Franco-American Fulbright Commission, NeuroDisc Foundation, and the Vinatier. So to begin, I'll provide a brief history and context, which really is important uh, to understanding the, the divergent paths around methadone and buprenorphine between these two countries. Um, so taking a step back around US drug policy, 
One could start before this, but at a high level in 1914, there was the Harrison Narcotics Tax Act, which regulated opioid and cocaine and really was, was deeply rooted in, in racist propaganda um, or, or supported through racist propaganda in passing this act. Um, and this act later in the courts was interpreted to suggest that physicians or to, to create a situation wherein physicians in the United States cannot prescribe opioids for treatment of opioid use disorder. And this has enormous repercussions and persists today. Um, and I'll explain this further, but it's really, this is what has led to the, the system of opioid treatment programs, or OTPs. I'm gonna fast forward now to the, the 1970s, where President Nixon declared a war on drugs. Again, uh, rooted really in, in politics and, and less in drug use. Uh, Reagan era drug laws followed in the 1980s which created mandatory minimum sentences, increased penalties for drug possession, and increased funding for drug enforcement. And again, these policies, which now are decades old, have really enormous repercussions both on how care systems are designed and also on the experiences of care and the experiences in, in the United States for people who use drugs. Fast forward again to 2002, where the Data 2000 Act allowed for buprenorphine prescribing for treatment of opioid use disorder outside of opioid treatment programs. So this was a really important change in this time, which expanded buprenorphine to uh, what were sort of known as ex-wavered clinicians who had uh, have some brief eight hours of training uh, in how to prescribe buprenorphine. And this ex-waiver was subsequently exed uh, or ended by President Biden in 2002. So, Again, kind of taking a very high level look, uh, drug policy in the United States really is one of crime and punishment, uh, which has led to mass, incarcera mass incarceration, punishment for people who use drugs, really disproportionate harms among black and other people of color, and segregation of methadone from the rest of healthcare. And I'll talk about what this looks like today. Um, but leading to a highly structured, inflexible care, uh, which really places the burden of care on, on Excuse me, excuse me, the burden of treatment on patients. So <clears throat> there's increasing and pressing need in the era of fentanyl in the United States to expand treatment access. As others have talked about earlier in this, session, in this conference, over 100,000 Americans die each year from overdose deaths, and fewer than 15% of Americans with opioid use disorder receive methadone or buprenorphine, which we all know is the most effective treatment uh, for opioid use disorder. There's also a disproportionate treatment gap and, and worse, morbidity and mortality amongst minoritized populations. So now taking a step back and looking at a timeline and history in France, uh, and I wanna thank my, my colleague and friend Anthony Plass for these slides, or for this slide, uh, which I've adapted. But in 1970, drug, drug use was prohibited by law. Uh, however, in 1987, there became legal authorization of syringe sales in pharmacies. And in 1995, really pivotal changes um, in response to the HIV AIDS crisis in France, where harm reduction policies were enacted. And this included free syringe distribution, efforts to increase methadone and buprenorphine. Again, fast forward to the early two or to the mid-2000s, where there were formation of Carud and Sapa. And then in 2016, laws permitted limited trials of drug consumption rooms. And what we can see in France is again, uh, a timeline that, that mirrors the adoption and really true integration of harm reduction policies, a public health approach rooted in harm reduction since 1995. And presently in France, over 80% of people with opioid use disorder receive methadone or buprenorphine. And this is a figure of utilization of buprenorphine in blue and methadone in red over time, and data from the OFDT. So as we then think about methadone and buprenorphine care systems, um, I'm now gonna move from the historical context to thinking about access. And um, I've used a conceptual framework just to organize some of this, thinking about kind of what is, how is the system organized and, and how can people then access the system, what are the ways in which the system accommodates patients and their needs, and what are patients' experience and care. 
Before I jump in, I do want to make the assertion that opioid use dis disorder care should be minimally disruptive. And this is somewhat of a simple idea that uh, with colleagues we've sort of expounded upon uh, in this paper. But the idea, the figure is more complicated than the idea. The idea is essentially um, we want to limit the burden of treatment and limit the burden of illness and make those aligned with an individual's capacity for work and, and their life demands. And so, again, just planting this idea of what is the work of treatment and, and what is the burden of illness and how do these compare in these two different countries. So to begin, thinking about how is care organized and available and in what settings is care located and who delivers it. So I also just want to make a few definitions. As I've mentioned in the US, an opioid treatment program is the only setting where patients can receive methadone. Also at opioid treatment programs, patients can receive buprenorphine or naltrexone, the other FDA approved medications for opioid use disorder in the United States. These are federally licensed and highly regulated uh, treatment settings. They're they're federally licensed, they're regulated at the local and state level often, and their services include medication as well as counseling groups, urine toxicology, and periodic assessments. In France, we have the SAPA, or Centre de Soins d'Accompagnement et de Prévention en Addictologie, and these are centers that offer free longitudinal anonymous care to people with addiction and also to people with risky or harmful substance use and those around them, including initiating methadone, also including buprenorphine care. And SAPAs carry out the mission of prevention, risk reduction, medical, psychological, and social care. So how are the systems organized? And I'm gonna start with methadone. In terms of initiating methadone, which is a process that can take weeks to months, in the US, as I've said, methadone's only dispensed through OTPs. Also, in hospitals, there is an exception wherein hospital clinicians can start methadone for the treatment of opioid use disorder, but once the patient is discharged, they have to receive methadone from an OTP. And hospital initiation is generally across the United States still uh, relatively uncommon, though certainly uh, happens in certain areas. Whereas in France, we have the SAPA for initiation and also any hospital. However, in France, every hospital has an ELSA, which is the equivalent of an addiction medicine consult service. For maintenance, methadone must be dispensed from an opioid treatment program. There are no prescriptions. Patients cannot get methadone for opioid use disorder at a pharmacy in the United States. There's no primary care, specialty addiction care, or pharmacy-based methadone care. And Importantly, methadone is also not permitted or feasible in many residential addiction settings. Whereas in France, methadone can be prescribed by any clinician in any setting, and this could be in a SAPA in a specialty addiction uh, setting or really in any other healthcare setting uh, for maintenance. And they can get, people can get medication through any pharmacy. When we think about buprenorphine, there are, the differences are less uh, remarkable. In the US, currently any clinician can prescribe buprenorphine and it can be dispensed from any pharmacy. However, it was just uh, within, within the year that this changed. So it was only in December of 2022. Uh, and before that, clinicians needed this special DEAX waiver. And still in the United States, buprenorphine is not permitted in many residential treatment programs such that people are forced off of this medication to be able to access residential care. In the US, excuse me, in France, buprenorphine is widespread. Any clinician can prescribe and it can be dispensed from any pharmacy. So this is a map of the United States really showing the, the enormous treatment deserts for methadone um, where there are areas that are larger than the size of France where there simply is no methadone access because there's no methadone within, within driving distance. And when you overlay, this is a map that overlays buprenorphine in addition to methadone um, and shows basically the, the account of medication for opioid use disorder types within a 30 minute drive. So you can see there remain really vast treatment deserts across broad geographical areas where people simply cannot access buprenorphine. With COVID, there's been the emergence of telehealth for buprenorphine, which has really increased access and increased retention in care, but treatment gaps remain. 
As, by comparison in France, um, this is a map of the Sapa across France, and you can see that there's a Sapa within, within each, uh, each region in France. And this is, uh, this is regulated and, and supported. And also, there are pharmacies across France, and I want to thank Mathieu Chappi for, for uh, helping me understand some of this. Um, but again, here's a map of, of the density of, of pharmacies in France, um, where within any specific population, I believe it's 2,000 people, there are a certain number of pharmacies. So <clears throat> next we'll talk about system accommodation, which is regardless of setting, how do people actually access care? And so for methadone in the United States, a travel time to OTP, as I've showed with these graphs, can be prohibitive, especially in rural areas, and there's no telehealth option. Whereas in France, travel to the SAPA for initiation can be challenging, and a community pharmacy may be more accessible. Telehealth is also permitted. When we look at the next row, Opioid treatment program hours in the U.S. can be very restricted. Um, for example, sometimes patients need to show up there between the hours of 6 a.m. and 10 p.m., uh, which can be very challenging, particularly if people don't have a roof over their head or don't have transportation. In France, they're typically full day. And again, it's not universal in the U.S. that these are restricted hours, but, but certainly there are clinics that, that are such. Uh, wait times to enter an opioid treatment program in the U.S. vary. Some OTPs can see patients same day, and others it may be weeks. Uh, in France, I don't have data to support this, but in talking with a number of people uh, nationwide, SAPA wait times can vary, and it sounds like it, it likely may take months. And I think this is a really important issue when we think about potential um, gaps and, and opportunities. And then when we look at access in terms of insurance, insurance access in the U.S. varies widely, uh, and in France, care is free and anonymous. Buprenorphine access, when we look at the U.S., there's a persistent shortage of buprenorphine providers in many areas, and COVID tele however, uh, the COVID telehealth flexibilities, as I said, have, have improved this. They're extended through the end of 2024, and with a lot of activism, I'm, I'm optimistic that these will persist. Uh, in France, buprenorphine is widely available. Telehealth is also an option. And as I've said, the insurance issues are like for methadone. So next, I just want to talk briefly about the experience in care and really thinking about once patients can access care, what is their experience like? How often are they asked to appear for, for care, for visits, shared decision making, including around medication doses um, and other treatment requirements? So one of the things that I particularly find the most stunning from my experience in both settings is the, the frequency of methadone visits. And so what I wanted to do to show this was just take an example of a patient who's newly initiating methadone in the U.S. versus in France. And I've sort of, this hypothetical patient is relatively medically and socially stable. So in the U.S. on days one through four, and this is, this is by rule um, and federally sort of, uh, regulated. Patients have to come every day, Monday through Saturday. In France, for the, first, for the first two weeks, patients come daily, Monday through Friday. For the subsequent days, uh, weeks, days 15 through 28, patients continue to come daily in the U.S., six days a week, whereas in France, they come about uh, two times uh, each week. Then continuing on for the next several weeks, again, six days a week in the U.S. versus once every two weeks in France. Moving on, the, that shift, again, exactly when that happens is at the discretion of the clinician, but they make shift from getting their medication at the SAPA to then getting their medication at a local pharmacy. And then when we look at uh, after a period of 90 days um, in the U.S., if patients meet basically meet stability cr criteria based on these eight-point criteria, they can then sort of liberalize their dosing frequency to five out of every seven days versus in France where they may be able to go to the pharmacy once every 28 days. And just displaying this difference visually, you can see that the, the, the dosing frequency is really quite stunning. And if we look in that first 90 days, in the U.S., it would be 77 visits to a methadone clinic as compared to 19 in France, and the subsequent 90 days, it would be 64 as compared to six visits. 
So again, when we think about this concept of minimally disruptive medicine and minimally disruptive care, um, you know, the showing up at that clinic every day is so disruptive. Methadone dosing is an interesting question and, and different in the U.S. and France in part, I think, because, or there may be different needs, uh, in part because of fentanyl, or largely because of fentanyl in the United States. But in the U.S., federal guidelines uh, recommend starting that, uh, or require, excuse me, that the first dose is no more than 30 milligrams. Patients can receive a second dose of 10 milligrams on their first day. Um, and then, in general, the recommendations are to increase every 5 to 10 milligrams every 3 to 5 days. Um, there is, there's nothing saying that this is, this is not regulated after that first day. However, in my experience, there is a lot of um, hesitation to go faster than that by many opioid treatment program physicians. In France, the starting dose is 30 to 40 milligrams, generally increasing 10 milligrams every three days as needed, um, and it is at the discretion of the clinician. And in, then, in term, and as I've said, in terms of sort of permission, um, there are some differences. In the United States, permission and willingness to tailor doses varies by OTP, by state, and by individual clinician. And to be able to split doses, uh, OTP clinicians need to get approval from a state, a state administrator. Uh, in France, it's, it's the clinician that tailors doses. Other differences, when we think about uh, the requirement for a physician visit, in the United States, this is within the first 14 days of treatment, and often on day one. In France, it has to be before initiating methadone, um, and it can be in person or sometimes uh, via telehealth. There is mandatory counseling in the United States that's required in 23 out of 50 states. It's not required in France. Urine drug tests, there's a minimum of eight random tests per year, and some uh, states require more than that. Um, and generally in France, there's a urine drug test at initiation and otherwise as indicated. Uh, also in the U.S., many states require lock boxes for take-home doses. Uh, and in buprenorphine, it's, it's much less regulated in both countries, or in, in the U.S., I should say. So to summarize, the widely divergent his, history and philosophical approaches between the U.S. and France has resulted in equally disparate methadone and buprenorphine delivery systems, really notable differences in where care is delivered, who can deliver it, and the demands placed on patients. And I would argue that the France model is minimally disruptive, especially when compared with the United States, and especially once patients are able to access care. Just to kind of put a, a story to this, um, I want to just briefly tell uh, two patient stories. Um, the first is a young woman I saw not long ago in the United States. She had a severe opioid use disorder, uh, was using fentanyl about a gram a day, and was in her third trimester of pregnancy. I saw her in the hospital where she was admitted with uh, high-risk pregnancy and really a desire to disrupt her, her opioid use. We started her on, she, excuse me, she had previously disrupted opioid use uh, on methadone treatment earlier in her pregnancy, but her car broke down. She lived 45 minutes from the nearest opioid treatment program, and she had tried buprenorphine, but it was insufficient to control her cravings. So in the hospital, we resumed her methadone, and we, we really advocated with the opioid treatment program and worked to figure out how she could get there physically once a day. But they refused to split her dose uh, and to, to give her twice, to give her take-home doses for her afternoon dose, which late in pregnancy is often really essential, and instead said that she could do it, but she would have to come twice a day to the OTP, which would have been over three hours of driving a day, six days a week, and she had very um, unreliable transportation. By contrast, uh, this is a patient who I had the opportunity to see with Dr. Icard uh, in Lyon, who was a young man with opioid cocaine, benzodiazepine use disorders, he had anxiety and paranoia, and he was seen in clinic where he presented with his mother. Again, this is an outpatient uh, setting, a specialty addiction setting. Previously, he had been reluctant to enter residential treatment. However, recent changes prompted his motivation. And in clinic, he was expressing increased cravings. We increased his methadone dose, offered a short course of benzodiazepines, given some heightened anxiety, um, and counseled, counseled regarding overdose prevention and harm reduction, coordinated follow-up in clinic, and then uh, within 10 days had a plan to enter withdrawal management and then directly get into residential addiction treatment. 
So as we think about the implications and structures of these systems, um, again, I'm, I'm just starting to kind of uh, explore these, but I think in the US, you know, we know that, that studies of take-home doses during COVID showed increased treatment retention and um, no increase in overdose deaths. There's a large movement underway to reform methadone systems in the US, and yet there remains a lot of resistance to this at, at multiple levels. And, and I can't help but wonder if decades-long experience in France could address some, particularly some clinician and policymaker fears of liberalizing methadone access um, related to visit frequency and delivery in OTP versus pharmacy settings. I also think that it's important for France to recognize that if methadone demand increases or perhaps even without a need for increased methadone demand, but certainly in, in the case of fentanyl in France, Long wait times at the SAPA may pose significant risks, and it may be important to consider ways to expedite access, including, for example, whether or not patients need to be seen by a physician before they dose, uh, and thinking about primary care initiation. Um, so with that, I want to extend a huge thank you to Professor, for Benjamin, Professor Rowland, the entire team at SWAL, and uh, others in Lyon who so graciously are hosting me. Um, I want to thank marie Geoffrey Roustide, who's been helping on this work, and uh, also my team at OHSU. Thank you very much. Thanks very much, Nora. Um, we'll have some questions at the end, hopefully. Uh, so the next speaker probably needs no introduction, but I'm going to introduce him anyway. Uh, so it gives me great pleasure to introduce uh, Professor Carl Mann, uh, who was the first chair in addiction research in Germany in 1999. And I think the, the growth of addiction research in Germany owes a lot to Carl's pioneering work. Uh, he's Professor Emeritus at University of Heidelberg. He's also founding president of our society, the European Federation of Addiction Societies, and he's going to speak to us today on comparing uh, guidelines on alcohol misuse between France and Germany. Thank you, Colin, and uh, good afternoon. Um, <coughs> when I accepted this invitation to talk about this topic, the invitation by Benjamin Roland, I said, well, this is kind of a dry matter, um, and it is indeed. But on the other hand, it is an important matter uh, for different reasons. And then I decided maybe I'm not talking about the most recent uh, recommendation, like 20, 30, 40 recommendations in France or in Germany, but rather about the process of ext establishing these guidelines, how is this being handled in France and in Germany, and what in the future could be a potential role of UFAS in facilitating uh, these processes and maybe in also uh, doing this together with some other countries in order to, to ease the, the, the process. So I thought I would concentrate on that. So I have uh, had the pleasure of collaborating with Audrey Jean Aubin from Paris, the University of Paris, uh, for, for many years, also in this realm of, uh, of guidelines. And so he is a co-author of this uh, talk here today. And all the uh, information about France comes from him. And the information about uh, Germany, of course, comes from me. And I would like also to make two more points in this introduction, which is, first of all, that Colin, the chair of this uh, symposium here, is kind of the can I call it the father of, uh, of, uh, of, of guidelines? He has been the coordinator of the NICE guidelines in the United Kingdom. Uh, in 2011, for instance, was the, uh, the main publication of these guidelines, and they have guided us in France and in Germany to a very large extent, and I will show you a few examples of that. So we do have some expertise here, and all the questions that you might have, I cannot answer, just put him over to, to Colin. So don't be shy. Just ask whatever you want. OK. So why do we need uh, 
guidelines and what could be the role of UFAS? I mean, you have seen this before, the goals of UFAS, uh, or some of them, in my mind, the goals are much easier and much uh, more limited in other people's mind. Uh, so these are the three most important, I think. And one thing is benchmarking. So that is about today, this talk is about benchmarking. How about in France? How about in Germany? And what can we learn from the mistakes that the Germans have made, the French have made? And uh, how can we can learn from the other countries? So what is a guideline? Uh, you see a definition here, practice guidelines systematically develop statements to assist practitioners and patients' decisions about appropriate healthcare. Very straightforward, it has some very important elements here. One is, for instance, uh, patients' decisions. So what we're doing, what we're trying to do with the guidelines is to inform patients uh, what could be a choice for their given problem in, with their health care. And not only that, but also in the process of developing the guidelines, we include patients. So there are patients sitting with us, with the professionals in those rooms, talking about potential recommendations, uh, discussing the, the, the evidence in the literature, et cetera, et cetera. So that is a very important uh, piece of that work, um, which has not been uh, so much uh, used and done before, before we started to do this, this guideline um, process. The other thing is, and we'll come back to that, systematically developed, et cetera, et cetera. But let me give you one more example why I think uh, we need guidelines. Of course, there's a, a thousand different treatment approaches in the alcohol field, in the drug field, in the smoke, smoking cessation field, et cetera, et cetera. And one example I like to, 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 to cite always is the lemon cure of alcoholism. Do you know the lemon cure of alcoholism? 29 le uh, lemons within one week cures alcoholism. Great. Or another one is the double chlorated whiskey treatment for alcoholics. Ever heard of that? It did exist, and another 50 of this kind did exist, and a lot of people were making a lot of money by advertising this and by offering this kind of treatment in their treatment units. And in order to put this into perspective, we do, of course, need double-blind, randomized controlled trials. And once you have them, you may have two or three or four with different outcomes. So how is the practitioner and how is the patient uh, able to, to sort out what is the right recommendation for him or her? So for that reason, you need this process of discussing, discussing and weighing and uh, quality control in these guideline groups to then come up with a recommendation, okay, this is what we would recommend and this is what we not recommend. Okay. So, in France, there is this French National Authority for Health, Haute Autorité de Santé, which has uh, come up with recommendations how to do bon pratique, so how to do good practice, and how to do clinical guidelines. And that is quite interesting because they said, <clears throat> well, what you need is that these guidelines that you uh, produce have validity. Uh, they have to be a source for medical education and there should not be a conflict of interest. And that is for good reasons because in the past, as we all know, there were quite a bit of interest, for instance, by the producers of treatments in pharmacotherapy, but also in psychotherapy, by the way, uh, who pushed their own uh, lemon cure, if you want, and that should be ruled out according to this uh, fr French uh, authority, national authority. But then, and they used this approach, uh, Henri Jean Aubin told me in the, uh, in the, in the example of tobacco uh, dependence and treatment of tobacco uh, dependence, smoking cessation, and the result was that all the experts that they wanted to invite 
had some kind of relation with treatment uh, producers, with pharmacotherapy, et cetera, et cetera. So in that group of uh, guideline uh, producers, there was not a single expert. So the result was that they did provide guidelines, but they were completely useless. There was nothing you could really draw out of that. And that is the reason, I'm just citing Jean Aubin here, that is the reason why for the alcohol guidelines, which were done in 2012, 13, 14, they decided not to follow this uh, example or this recommendation of the French government, which is by itself already interesting. So they, the expert decide not to do what the government tells them to do. Um, interesting, but France is the country of liberty and egalité, etc. So it's still, uh, it seems to be uh, still alive. Uh, that's very nice. Okay, so they did it in another way. So they included the expert. They, because of that negative uh, uh, experience they had with this other approach, and of course, they were much faster than this tobacco guideline, for instance, with these non-experts. Okay, so how did that go? Well, first of all, back to Germany. So there is something similar, not from the government, but from an association of the so-called scientific medical societies, RVMF, in Germany. They have about 180 uh, uh, medical societies, like for surgery, for ear, nose, and throat, for, I don't know, for kidney diseases. And there's also one uh, out of the three societies in addiction that we have one. Ours, uh, by the way, is also part of that. So they have come up with uh, recommendations how to do these guidelines, and I will walk you through a little bit uh, the recommendations that were used in France and in Germany. Okay, and here are the recommendations or the levels of uh, evidence that you can get and the, the, um, the how would you call that, the, 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 the certainness, the sureness that some of the recommendations are very, very good and very well founded in science and others are not so much. So there is one, uh, for instance, where you have no representative guideline panel expanding, uh, uh, working on that, no systematic uh, evidence, and no formal structured process in discussing. That would be the S1, the old one, and some of the fields in medicine still are on that level. Of course, down here is the other the other uh, extreme, the so-called three-level or S3 guidelines, where you do have a representative guideline panel, which means that all the stakeholders in the country have to be part of that process. In our case, where we did alcohol guidelines and tobacco guidelines at the same time with the same group of people, that meant 50 to 60 people, you know, experts, but also relatives of patients, patients themselves, and uh, stakeholders from all kinds of, of, of uh, involved uh, authorities, uh, treatment providers, et cetera, et cetera. So that meant representative guideline panel. Systematic evidence, of course, we'll come to that. And then also something uh, maybe very German, <laughs> when, the, when it came to the, to, the, um, to the decision and the voting on recommendations then, uh, you had a formal structured process. Not everybody could, same, could talk at the same time. Something hard to, to, uh, to imagine here in ATHS or in France maybe. No? This was a joke, uh, Benjamin. Okay. <laughs> anyway, so there is a structured process uh, which is nice to have uh, so that uh, you don't uh, lose too much time in coming to a decision finally. Okay. Now, for these guidelines, you had first to have uh, the idea of what do we, we want to talk about. Then you had to, to have a developmental group. Then you had to establish the clinical questions, systematic literatures, et cetera, et cetera. In the end, you have the full guideline. And then the question is how do you disseminate and implement and evaluate that stuff? Going back to France, a little bit of the history of these guidelines. You know, it started like in 99 uh, about indications, aims in the alcohol field, and then we had something like alcohol drinking during pregnancy, and the most recent ones were at that time uh, the alcohol misuse screening diagnosis and development. And we are talking about this one here compared with the German one. 
Okay, here is how it was done in France. They did have a, a steering committee, of course, talking about methodology, planning, uh, planning, et cetera, et cetera, bibliography. Then they had a work group doing this kind of work with different versions, and then they had a review group, and that is interesting also for the context of this meeting and this symposium, because the review group was uh, consisted of people, experts out of UFAS. So UFAS was used for these French guidelines as an external reference group, review group, review group, and which gave their consent or gave their recommendations or critique or whatever. So that is how that happened and, and was done. And here are the names of these people, uh, Francois Pay, Henri Jean Aubin, Madame Gillet, uh, they were in the steering committee. I was invited in, into this work group, I was invited to work with them. And then the review group I just mentioned, there was like uh, Professor Drummond here, there was Connor Farron, one of our newly elected members of the, of the EC of UFAS. There was, uh, ah yeah, Emanis Scafato, and Friedrich Wurst, who's also in the audience today. So people who have been working with guidelines for a long time, they spent some time in doing these reviews. Okay. So how is this being developed, such a guideline, in the example of Germany? First, there was the clinical question, and you can see in, in the alcohol field, we had 22 overall question. For tobacco, we had 29. And they were, we came up with those with the Delphi process. And I don't have to explain the Delphi process here, I think. The next step was the, we were looking now at the international guideline. We have a given question, and then we look, is there already something there which answers that question, for instance. So we were looking at this, and, but we, and we found, uh, I can't really read it here from here, like 20 some uh, international guidelines in alcohol and 18 in tobacco. But then we had to do a quality control of these guidelines and say only if they are beyond a certain score, which has been published and validated, et cetera, the Delby score, then we can use these guidelines for our, to answer our question. So if yes, then it went into a treatment recommendation. And that consists of a level of evidence. How good is the, uh, the uh, scientific evidence for the question? Should we take nicotine replacement, uh, yes or no, or should be this or that drug, or this or that uh, uh, psychotherapy? And then that comes up with a level of recommendation with A, very strong recommendation, B, not so strong, but still evidence, and zero, we don't really know, but it looks not too bad, in a way. So, if there was not an international guideline, then we had to do the systematic reviews ourselves. We had to look what is there. Again, they were quality controlled, and after that, uh, if there was nothing there for us to answer that question or one, any of the other questions, then we had to do the systematic reviews ourselves and do the meta-analyses and look at the RCTs. And that is extremely time consuming. We produced a book of 500 pages, 500 pages in the alcohol uh, guideline, which has the results of these uh, uh, systematic reviews and RCT uh, uh, results, also with the commentary, how good or bad, or how well does this fit to, to the German situation, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. So an enormous amount of work, a lot of money going into this, and really a reason to call for international uh, 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 collaboration, because why should we do it all by ourselves? and not ask our friends from, from Holland, Wim van der Brink here, how are they doing it and why don't we do it together, for instance. Okay. So these are three examples now from the German guideline, very simple and very clear cut and, and, and evident, I think. The audit should be used and should be done, strength of recommendation A, level of evidence 1A, very good, and then we had to, to vote. So the consensus you see in that group of 60 people was 93%, not 100%, funny enough. Although the, the strength of recommendation and the level of evidence, independent of the, of the voting, was uh, very strong. 
And then a, uh, another one, short interventions, et cetera, et cetera, also pretty clear cut. And then the third one was maybe the most interesting at that time, I think that still holds true. How about harm reduction in the alcohol field? Can we think of treatment goals which are short of abstinence? And you can imagine these 50, 60 people also representing the rehabilitation hospitals which have made their money for 40 years following the abstinence paradigm in the alcohol treatment field, how they feel about this and how they are going to vote about this. So that was a very difficult, cumbersome uh, dis uh, discussion here. We were extremely happy that Colin Drummond had worked on this before and in one of our uh, 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 conversations, he said, you know, when they were discussing this for the NICE guidelines, a lot of blood was being spilled. And that was true for us too, but then everybody was so tired at the end that we came up with this, uh, this uh, compromise, if you want, <laughs> and we had a consensus of 100%. It was like in the old days in 1968, you know, everybody's tired, then, oh, okay. Well, anyway, but this was a step forward because that opens the door to um, some first step into uh, harm reduction in, in the alcohol field, uh, allowing for treatment goals short of absence, which means reduction or the so-called controlled drinking. Okay, so these were some examples. Now let's compare the two models, and this is again a slide that Jean Aubin has prepared. You can see there was, as I said, a large working group uh, uh, east of the Rhine and a limited working group west of the Rhine River and this group process and uh, here the limited bibliographic review and now is one point we which, which we will look into closer, the industri industrial funding uh, and the conflict of interest. So there was no industrial funding in the German side because of the AWMF guidelines there was industrial funding in France in spite of the national authority which claimed or which wanted uh, them not to have a, an industrial funding, etc. There was as a pretty strong internal validity in the German thing. It take four, almost five years until the uh, publication. And um, in, on the other side, there was this external validation by UFAS and it took a year and a half. So there are, there are strengths and weaknesses on each of these sides. And we can learn from that. And we can now discuss uh, how can we get this and put this together. Uh, but that uh, may be something which I'll come to in two or three minutes. Let's first have a look at the conclusions. Uh, well, I think I've really touched upon this. What's also important is this uh, focus on GP practice in France and also to a certain extent in, in Germany. It was not only for the specialists, but it was also for a broader field in, in, in the MDs, but also uh, uh, clinical psychologists, of course. Okay, now the financial disclosure. I don't know how much the uh, French guidelines cost it uh, in order to be uh, 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 done and, and, and published. I do know for the, for the germ guidelines, the two, the alcohol and the tobacco cessation, cost 500,000 euros. And this was not government money, it was not industry money, it was uh, financed by the, uh, the societies, by the, by the scientific societies and by some of the uh, academic centers like my own, so I put at least 100,000 euros workforce, working hours by my staff into that. So very, very costly, very expensive. Uh, uh, but no industrial funding. Uh, and for the, for, for the French side, you can see that there was some funding from, from, from the pharmaceutical industry. Now the conflict of interest in, uh, you, you don't need to have to be able to read the right-hand side. Uh, it is defined here on the left-hand side and what we did in Germany was that every year each of these participants had to declare their conflict of interest. So did I have, did I get some money for some consultation of a pharmaceutical company? 
And if I did, then I could discuss, but I was not allowed to vote. So I was excluded from voting for this specific question. But also in the same way, if I was a, the, the president of a society for behavioral uh, psychotherapy, then I could discuss, but I was not allowed to vote on which kind of psychotherapy we would recommend. So again, pretty complex, uh, not easy to do uh, um, process, but uh, it did work and it was not, not really then all that that uh, complicated in the end once we had we got used to that and it also was true interest i think interestingly enough for people who were treatment providers like some people who owned hospitals in the rehabilitation part of treatment uh, uh, programs in germany so if that was there then if we decided we, we discussed a a point concerning uh, hospitals and the hospital, uh, or the, 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 sis the system which, in which patients are being uh, uh, um, treated, then this person was not allowed to vote in that respect or for that recommendation. So, in summary, it brings up some uh, clinical recommendations, of course. In the alcohol field was 172 recommendations. In the tobacco field, I think we had about 80 or 90. And uh, so we can recommend some of, uh, of, of these things. Which uh, Another thing which is also important, we can also say this treatment approach does not work. This is nonsense. This is rubbish. Like the lemon cure of alcohol, it's complete rubbish, of course. So we could say that also for some other uh, approaches as well. OK, I've touched upon the others. And I want to finish with something that, <laughs> how about the splendor and the misery of guidelines? So there's some splendor for guidelines, but there's also a lot of misery for guidelines. So the splendor would be you facilitate diagnosis of the disorder. You can assist health professionals, patients, and families to find the best treatment available. You can reduce inappropriate variations in care, you can provide a focus for education, also for training and future research. So that's the nice part of it, and I think it's true. It would be interesting to hear your opinion about this later. The misery of guidelines, well, of course, they're extremely costly. costly. And that was for me the, <laughs> the, most, the most cumbersome point. You do not get rid of bias, in spite of these enormous efforts, you know, by uh, taking out conflicts of interest, by uh, uh, looking, is there a, a hundred percent, is there an evidence of 1A or is it only 2B? Uh, and then that has to be weighted against side effects, for instance. But not only in the pharmacotherapy field, also in the psychotherapy field, because there are side, side effects in psychotherapy as well, or undesired effects, if you want. So that was a discussion which was very difficult, and in many, many cases, we did barely make the 75% uh, congruence in the in the vote, and so that was really interesting to 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 see. And then, of course, when you publish them, they're already outdated, which in a way is true. We did publish with Jürgen and with Colin in the European Addiction Research. We did publish a a, a benchmarking uh, a systematic review also of guidelines in the alcohol field in Europe. So, if you're interested in that, it's not on the slide, so it's, that's worth looking at. Well, then there needs to be uh, follow-ups, and they are necessary, but are they manageable, and how can that be done? Um, I think I forgot it was one of those, of those uh, um, slides also. There are both in France and in Germany updates of these guidelines. So if you're really interested, if you want to know what are the most recent recommendations, there's an update in Germany from 2022, I think, and in France in 2023 or, or the other way around. So there are updates there, and in the, in the case of Germany, there is not so much really different from what we published uh, five, six, or seven years ago. Okay, so what can be the, the, the role of UFAS? As I said, uh, maybe, I'm not sure, of course, maybe uh, we could convene um, member societies which are working on, on, on guidelines 
and see whether we can at least do some of these processes together or we, whether we can learn from each other. Uh, that is something that UFAS could offer and would be ready to offer, I think. Uh, again, based on the, on the British uh, uh, groundbreaking work uh, 10, 12 years ago and the continuation of that work in the UK. So that would be something that I could see as a step forward and as a contribution of UFAS for the field. Shall we reinvent the wheel? Well, maybe not. I don't think we need it. And you can see here four examples. There are, of course, more of guidelines which have already been published. And uh, we do need international collaboration and, and, and benchmarking as well, uh, and, 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 and counseling, uh, et cetera, et cetera. So here's all the Jean Aubin and myself. And you can see what I said. Bottom line, l'union fait la force. Thank you very much. Thanks very much, Carl. Um, so the next part is uh, the UFAS European Addiction Research Award, which I'm going to introduce as president of UFAS. Uh, this is an award that's been uh, in operation since 2016, and it's a collaboration between UFAS and the journal European Addiction Research. Uh, the award goes to a scientist in the addiction research field who's made an outstanding lifetime contribution, particularly in relation to human research. Uh, each year we invite nominations from our member societies, of which there are 32 across 24 countries. Um, the decision on who to award this to is, is made by a nomination committee chaired by the past president of UFAS, which in this case is Geert Dom, who unfortunately can't be with us today. Uh, the committee also includes the editor of European Addiction Research, who is currently Professor Karen Ersch. Uh, the awardee is then invited to give a lecture and also to submit a publication to European Addiction Research. Uh, this year, the award goes to uh, Professor John Marsden, who many of you will know is Professor of Addiction Psychology at King's College London. Um, <clears throat> he's conducted extensive research on evaluation of novel psychological and pharmacological treatments for drug misuse. And he's also chief editor of the journal Addiction. So John, unfortunately, cannot be with us today, but I'm hoping through the miracle of technology, we will see his award lecture anytime soon. À la régie, s'il vous plaît, si vous pouvez envoyer la vidéo. Merci. Hello, everyone. I'm deeply honored to receive the UFAS award this year. I'm also very sorry not to be able to join you in person. But I'm very delighted to record this presentation for you on the topic of interventions for opioids and stimulant use disorders, a search for effectiveness. I'm sure you'd all imagine that the occasion of this award encouraged me to look over my shoulder to some extent and to think about some threads of my clinical academic work over recent years. And indeed, the search for uh, improving effectiveness for opioid use disorder and finding any effective intervention for stimulant use disorder has been a, a core thread and one that I hope weaves together an interesting account for you uh, at the meeting. I've got some affiliations and disclosures and the research I'm going to summarise uh, was all sponsored by King's College London and the South London and Maudsley NHS Trust 
uh, with research costs and the materials funded by the Department of Health, uh, NIHR and Endymion. I, I kind of ran out of space in a sense here. There's so many colleagues to thank. These are among the um, key investigators in the, the, the studies that I'm going to summarize, but many more could be added. So what's the structure? So I'm going to spend a little bit of time setting out the context for my presentation to you, uh, focusing on opioids and stimulant use in the UK. I'll then offer a few words about our first line standard of care interventions for OUD and use some of the cohort studies that we've done to highlight how in our context there's a clear rationale uh, to continue offering these interventions but to search for ways they can be improved. And I'll then use um, the core of my uh, talk to summarise uh, three uh, successive randomised control trials uh, that my team has been doing in, in recent years, uh, looking at uh, helping harder to treat patients with OUD uh, and also those who have uh, parallel or dual opioid use disorder and cocaine use disorder, which is a particularly uh, troublesome um, um, combination for us clinically. I'll then look at uh, our efforts to um, help people with uh, cocaine use disorder, particularly those with primary cocaine use disorder, so a novel cognitive therapy. I'll then spend time looking at a uh, superiority trial of extended release buprenorphine, summarising those threads together and um, just outlining what we hope is our next trial, which actually layers on top of this um, uh, previous set of trials. It's so important to set context for studies. Um, unless you're very um, thoughtful, you can immediately think about why a study um, should have been done in a different way in your own com uh, com country context. Um, and so in the UK, uh, at the moment at least, we have a problem that is essentially related to heroin imported into the country uh, with a very long established trade route um, and also cocaine use disorder. Uh, if I was brought up in North America, we, I would be talking uh, also about prescription uh, analgesics and methamphetamine. Uh, we have local time limited outbreaks of um, fentanyl analogues and isotomizazine compounds that have mercifully not expanded, but we are very watchful and concerned. But my story today is about heroin and also mainly the smokable form of cocaine, which is very prevalent in the UK, um, sometimes called rock or crack cocaine. And as you can see, in terms of treatment, uh, people in treatment in England, we've got two primary and quite large populations, uh, people with uh, heroin uh, use disorder and people with opioid heroin and cocaine use disorder. We do attract a relatively small number of people from the crack using population into treatment, but they don't really stay long. And the reason for that is largely because we don't have a, a licensed medication to offer. And as you'll uh, hear, our, our, our efforts to offer people psychosocial interventions are, are, not, are not particularly successful. There are important instrumental links between opioid use and cocaine use disorder. Uh, both drugs can be used uh, concurrently for their combined effect and they can also be used sequentially in a drug using episode to um, increase or offset the effects of the other drug. So for example, uh, someone that is, who uses opioids might use cocaine afterwards to increase or, or, or antagonize sedation and uh, someone that uses crack cocaine uh, might then later in an episode of using, use heroin or an op another opioid to manage acute withdrawal effects of cocaine. So they are instrumentally or synergistically linked uh, in the accounts of many of our patients. And that, that's a real problem for them and for us in terms of passing out and trying to help the, um, 
what, what should be the clinical targets. So I want to just summarize uh, some cohorts for you briefly. Um, we're very fortunate in the UK. Um, it's rare to be able to say that, isn't it? Uh, but we're fortunate in having an almost real-time outcome monitoring system uh, for patients that are in receipt of National Health Service and non-governmental treatments. And we're able to use uh, cohort studies. Um, most of the time our cohort studies represent everyone that started treatment in a particular year. And we can then follow up patients to look at various um, outcome indices of, of treatment response. This was the first study we did um, back in 2008 when we just set up this new system. 20,000 or so patients who, who started uh, medication assisted treatment using an opioid agonist or partial agonist across England, across all English community treatments. And after six months, um, we used a reliable change index to show the proportion of people uh, at assessment at that point uh, in treatment who were abstaining, uh, who weren't abstaining but had improved compared to their baseline level of uh, heroin use. Uh, those that essentially were using the same uh, amount or uh, the same frequency of heroin use at follow-up as at admission. And as you can see, three and a hundred or so patients who were, who were deteriorated, if that's the right word, and were using more often than at admission. So if we take the abstinent and improved groups together, that's quite a strong treatment response. But obviously we've got people that haven't abstained and those that are unchanged. And so it's a mixed picture of, of endorsement of our efforts for our standard of care treatments, but with a lot of headroom for improvement. And one thing we noticed early on was that patients who um, admitted to treatment who were also using crack cocaine, their heroin abstinence response was moderated, as you can see. So those who used heroin and crack at admission had a lower level of heroin abstinence than those who were heroin uh, dependent only, as you can see. So that set us thinking about ways in which we should focus on targeting, helping people um, increase their abstinent response, uh, targeting patients that hadn't changed, and of course, not losing track of those that appeared to need possibly a different offer or a more intensive treatment. Along with colleagues across the world, retention is always um, a concern. If we look at how long people stay in um, opioid use disorder treatment in England, so I'm coming more up to date now, this is a, uh, a cohort of all admissions uh, in 2018, so that's 42,000 people. Actually, our, ret our retention rate isn't as concerning as it is in North America, for example. Um, but nevertheless, by 12 weeks, we've got 40% of people that have left. And we, we are really talking about a retention-oriented intervention that is, is founded on encouraging patients with OUV to stay for longer, for sure. But you can see that we're losing patients progressively each month. Uh, so our retention rate is encouraging, but shows uh, a missed opportunity, of course, for 40% or so of patients who, who have left and who we would like, and they perhaps themselves would like to stay in treatment for longer. I'll address that uh, in the third trial uh, uh, later on in my talk. One novel study that we've done that we're, we're very um, keen on describing is a very rare study in that we, we also looked at 8,000 patients who never left treatment for five years. I, I don't think it's been done before. Uh, it may well have been. Um, but nevertheless, it hasn't been done in the UK before. And so this was looking at everyone over five years uh, of, for con continuous retention. And we used some fairly arcane statistics to see if we could ca characterize the treatment response of that large sample of people over five years. We use an instrument called the Treatment Outcomes Profile, which um, services complete as an interview. It's got a little timeline follow back and some other questions uh, with patients um, as often as they like, but, but usually every three to six months. 
and then that's uploaded to our national drug treatment monitoring system. So here's a, um, a growth chart of the passing out those 8,000 people into treatment responses, simply on the basis of the number of days a month they used heroin over half yearly follow-ups over five years. And this uses a latent growth curve model. It's pretty, as I say, pretty arcane, but it does enable us to see some tendencies uh, over time in terms of the trajectories. And um, if you scan that image, you can see there's a, there's a green line at the bottom, which indicates a group of people that um, were essentially in treatment for relapse prevention, which is a very welcome um, group, not particularly numerous, 17% uh, of the total. You can then see a group uh, in light blue who um, started at about 25 out of 28 days of heroin use a month, and after six months of treatment, really rapidly uh, reduced that to the point where they essentially used very occasionally or not at all. You can then see a black line that takes a slower route to a very favorable retention outcome at five years. So that's a slower train to abstinence, as you can see, but progressive reductions at each assessment over time. Then finally, we've got two groups that are obviously more concerning. On the one hand, we've got a red line where there may be all manner of harm reduction benefits uh, associated with this group. But after some, uh, whether it's regressive or some improvements uh, to six months of treatment, there's not really any further um, uh, reduction over time, even though they don't leave treatment. Perhaps equally concerning, but with a different profile, we've looked at some of the characteristics of these curves, which I won't uh, belabor today. We've got a, um, a gold line, finally, where there's a very welcome and speedy uh, improvement profile, but it seems to run out of gas at two and a half years, and then there's a, there's a progressive increase in heroin use. And so this sustained progressive response is really welcome for this very persistent disorder. But the marginal and deteriorating response is a real call to action uh, in our treatment system to try and reach those particular in, uh, individuals and offer uh, a different offer or different or more uh, intensive interventions. So I want to talk um, about a, a study we did which was focusing on uh, what we called hard to treat or harder to treat patients with OUD and uh, OUD and CUD. Um, this was a single clinical study, um, quite expensive in that what we wanted to do was see if we could offer um, a full list of psychosocial interventions. If you think of the, the you know, all of the ones that get reviewed by uh, NICE or NIDA in the US or elsewhere, what would you come up with? You think of contingency management, you think of family therapy, you think of CBT, you think of motivational interviewing, you think of social behavior network therapy, you might think of 12-step facilitation. And we thought, well, what if we could offer all of those um, to the best of our ability to patients that were in, enrolled in treatment for our medication standard of care but weren't doing as well as they would like or we would like. So our background theory on this was that there have been lots of different manual-driven therapies tested, but what if we threw away the manual and we just said, okay, what are the, what are the effective elements of these manuals? And could we have a much more personalized offer? But we would look pretty churlish if we didn't include some type of reinforcement contingency management intervention, behavioral couple interventions, uh, always features in the top three when reviewed internationally by systematic reviewers, and also 12-step based groups. Um, a Cochrane review that we were very interested by, for example, concluded that among 13 different psychosocial interventions for a, a opioid agonist therapy as, as an adjunctive intervention, none were effective. And we felt as if that might be missing the fact that at a population level, you might get a, a null effect, but for subgroups, there might well be a, a, 
if you like, a patient treatment matching effect, and that's what we set out to study. We used a very formulation-based approach with our patients, um, fashioning a hypothesis of why their OUD was unresponsive. And we looked at various cognitive, affective, and interpersonal factors that might um, serve to maintain that um, unwanted uh, disorder craving, um, emotional dysregulation, um, hazardous in, uh, social context, etc. And we put together a toolkit with interventions from the uh, uh, therapies that you can see here. And we offered all or any of these to patients um, according to their formulation and also their interest and preference. It was a sort of no wrong door study and that we, we we tried something and if it didn't work we were encouraged that we had always something else that we could offer but remember these are patients that are not responding particularly um, so their their characteristics were enrollment in our opioid agonist therapy service in south london um, they would need to be using at least one day of heroin or cocaine in the past month with uds verification of course, they, many were using a great deal more days than that. We, we stratified by the usual things that we, we randomized to um, get this psychosocial intervention or to continue with treatment as usual. Our primary outcome was treatment response at 18 weeks, and we defined that as no use of opioids uh, or cocaine during the 28 days before follow-up and one or more negative urine drug tests um, in the previous month for heroin and cocaine and no positive tests. So it was a sort of binary treatment response uh, endpoint. What we found was that we certainly didn't encourage people to leave treatment, which was welcome. So at 18 months, um, almost everyone was uh, continued to be enrolled in treatment. So actually our retention was actually rather encouraging you might think back to that coloured growth chart uh, that I showed a moment ago. There was no difference in dose of drug, maybe, uh, so there was no sort of sense of confound of our results by the level of um, pharmacotherapy dose. We delivered intervention by um, a psychology assistant team, uh, supervised by myself and two colleagues. Um, patients attended a reasonable number of sessions, 60% um, attended at least a third. And here's the end point. So at follow-up, 16% of participants in our PSI group were responders compared to seven in the control group. And that's a statistically significant um, odds ratio. Um, there is uh, an economic uh, cost-effectiveness analysis in favor of the PSI, but I, there's no doubt, is there, that that's a fairly low level response, but we did manage to help patients who were not responding to medication improve their response likelihood, but it still shows a huge amount of uh, road ahead to, to, to find even better ways of, of uh, improving outcomes. Just to show a couple of secondary outcomes, uh, when, you, when you use a more perhaps sensitive measure, percent days abstinence uh, for both opioids and crack cocaine, there's statistically significant effects for PSI. The work and social adjustment scale was also statistically significant in favor of um, uh, improved social functioning for our intervention, but not for any of the other measures that you can see there. So second uh, trial, having worked with patients who were not responding as well as they would like, or we would like, from medication, we really turned our attention on cocaine use disorder as a primary focus. Um, first of all, noting that uh, although things are changing, at that point there was really no great endorsement that we could see of a, a, a candidate pharmacotherapy. And we felt as if, you know, buoyed up from our work with psychosocial interventions that we might be able to provide um, our patients with some effective psychosocial intervention. 
And we first of all, as you might expect, spend a lot of time thinking about the way in which CUD is um, developed and maintained. And primarily, we've got an exposure-driven process in which you know, previously drug-neutral objects, such as this uh, pretty grotty-looking ATM machine in South London that I photographed, which of course has nothing to do with drugs for the majority of the members of the local community, but for a person with CUD, it's become very much a conditioned stimulus through repeated exposure. So encountering the image, uh, the, the reality of an ATM in the, in the community could induce uh, a variety of thoughts and feelings that relate to um, the motivation to use cocaine. So we felt as if we needed to really think about how we could loosen those numerous conditioned processes that befall uh, someone with a cocaine use disorder. There's been lots of effort to do that in the past using very um, frank exposure techniques. And we were inspired very much from work that we'd also done with PTSD. And we wanted to get much more into cognitive restructuring, getting into appraisals and the meaning of conditioned uh, uh, cues and the consequences thereafter. And what we did was we asked our patients to um, really personalize their cues for us. And we said to them, would, would you take this disposable camera or will you use your phone and take a bunch of pictures uh, over the next week that when looked at would be a direct reminder or a trigger of your cocaine use. So it might be a picture of a place, uh, an object, uh, a scene, and as you can see there's lots of photographs here of just pretty unremarkable street corners that mean nothing to us but mean, that mean a lot to the person. Also objects, um, makeshift uh, crack pipes, um, paraphernalia, etc. And we asked patients to do that and we put all of what they brought into the clinic into a box. It was really crude experimental uh, psychological therapeutics, I, I, I don't, I, but I make no apology for it. Very, very idiosyncratic. And what we then did was we said, okay, we've, got a, we've now got a box of triggers. And um, having formulated lots of different craving experiences in terms of fast occurring thoughts, elaborations, memories, mental images, sensations, etc. We repeated and used exposure in which we asked patients to literally open the box and to look through over the course of a couple of minutes the contents so that we could elicit and then helpfully elaborate a whole complex array of thoughts and feelings um, and beliefs uh, about the person and the world and their disorder. And then when you, we then, having elicited, uh, we found it to be a very effective way of eliciting very personal thoughts in a way that showing someone the, a video, a standard library video, may not be sufficiently um, arresting for an individual. They may just think, oh yeah, that's just one of those films, isn't it? Doesn't mean anything to me. That's not the way I use it, or that's not where I buy, etc. So that idiosyncratic approach was very, very effective. We also used some film in that we, we filmed um, uh, a facsimile of preparing a crack pipe, uh, breaking it down into a storyboard uh, with a, a, a volunteer patient, and then filming the, the various episodes in, the, in, the, in a sequence of smoking cocaine. And we played that to uh, a, a patient as well, and they could select from whether it was male or female, or whether it was heroin or crack cocaine on their own, or, or both. So uh, it was a small study, um, very, very intensive, so lots and lots of CBT, a week of uh, uh, cognitive restructuring and uh, idiosyncratic exposure, but a nice effect, an encouraging effect for abstinence from cocaine at a month and three months in favour of, of our memory focus cognitive therapy. So we've now put that intervention in our toolkit. Uh, it's expensive, 
It's not particularly scalable given the resource constraints we have in the UK, but it is something we offer patients who, who really struggle and, and, and experiencing distressing, bothersome craving. So the third and final study um, I want to talk about today brings me up to date with a trial um, on extended release um, buprenorphine for OUD. Um, this is a study we've been running over the last uh, three years or so. Uh, we ran it during COVID and we're reaching the, the, the welcome end point with acceptance for it in a mainstream medical journal um, in a week or so, we hope. And I want to just show you how what I've discussed already feeds into the EXPO study um, and, uh, and I'll end up then with some thoughts about the future. So we have got a story with extended release buprenorphine uh, of some investigational and now two licensed products. It was a subdermal implant uh, manufactured by Titan called Probufine um, and uh, that was subject to uh, investigation research trial investigation, but it's now left the, the market. So it, I, I believe the company is now, is now pivoted to chronic pain for this. So we don't have that one available. Um, what we do have are two um, alternative formulations of uh, extended release subcutaneous injectable buprenorphine. One um, often called Buvidal, but not always, uh, manufactured by Camerus uh, in a weekly or monthly formulation. The other, a monthly formulation called Sublocade or Subutex Pro uh, in very given territories, uh, manufactured by Indivia. And the Indivia product was the one that we were able to evaluate for the first time in a superiority trial. And we compared that just in the footnote to all of the uh, opioid agonist treatment standard of care medications. So that's methadone, the um, full opioid uh, mu opioid receptor agonist, and also the, all the various forms of uh, transmucosal buprenorphine tablet, uh, polymer film, and uh, a lyophilis of wafer. So we were interested in, in trialing this because a lot of our patients do feel that attending community retail pharmacies for observed oral tablet or liquid dosing for OUD isn't that great? They feel stigmatized. Um, it's a very, it's a, there's a drudge of routine and, and they often cite it as a reason for leaving early. So that hooked us in with our concerns about retention. Patients complain sometimes that, you know, the, the, the strictures that we put in front of safe induction and dosing and the sort of community safety arrangements are not that easy for them to adhere with. So with the Indivia product, the idea of a monthly injection is a really simple dosing option, we thought. We thought it might even achieve opioid blockade so that patients would have control over craving because of the good pharmacodynamic plasma circulating levels of, of buprenorphine. And that also potentially any, any lapses of use of um, heroin in our context might be block so that they wouldn't get the subjective effects, thereby inducing a, 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 a very virtuous operant learning um, process that would mean that there would be no further heroin use. Um, lots of um, qualitative studies showing patient endorsement, but we also thought that this wouldn't be the offer for everyone and that some patients would want um, you know, a, a, a strong ag primary agonist, for example. So in the background context of non-inferiority trials establishing the, the Camerus product uh, and also that we were going to you know, draw breath and do a superiority study, I'll tell you a little bit about this study called EXPO, so Extended Release Pharmacotherapy for Opioid Use Disorder. Uh, it was done in five centres, uh, coordinating uh, in London, in the West Midlands, the northwest of England, the northeast and into uh, Scotland in Tayside, all areas with a very long-standing um, uh, high-level prevalence of opioid use disorder. This was a 24-week study, open-label RCT. Uh, we opened it to as many patients as 
would be interested. Um, and we could include all the forms of standard of care. So methadone, all forms of sublingual buprenorphine. Doses not managed by us, or t complete free titration to desired or clinical effect. We used the US uh, manufactured product Sublocade. Um, that was it, it imported for, uh, for us into England, wasn't available at the time. It's just received market authorization in July this year for England, which is a very welcome development. We had two loading doses as per the label, so that's two doses of 300 milligrams subcutaneously. Um, the only difference is that we, because we wanted patients to get the two loading doses pretty quickly and flexibly, we allowed the second dose to be a minimum of 21 days rather than the label of a minimum of 26 days. And that just gave our patients a little bit more flexibility. There were then four maintenance doses, uh, either 100 as per label. There could be 300 if the patient wanted that. And we just allowed patients to have a discussion with their prescriber to keep things as flexible as possible according to preference and symptom control, offering rescue buprenorphine at any time. Uh, we powered the, st the study for 304 participants for the head-to-head. -head. We overshot the runway a tiny bit and in the end randomized 314 to continue in their standard of care or to receive six months of supplicate. Our primary endpoint was opioid abstinence. We haven't got a responder um, characterization that we used in the trial I mentioned at the beginning. We wanted to capture each and every day of response over six months. And I'm going to use some data visualization techniques to characterize our primary endpoint, which I've become very taken with and I think uh, are, are hugely um, illuminating, really, into the pattern of response at a patient level. Um, lots of secondaries, I, I'll mention a couple, uh, an economic analysis which I'm not going to mention today because of time, nor some qualitative studies, but a, a fairly unremarkable contemporary sort of 21st century RCT across the world was expert in a sense. So we wanted uh, to include patients with moderate to severe OUD at admission but also those that were um, um, either not responding but retained during treatment. That hooks me back to early slides, I hope you'll recall. And also patients that might be completely abstaining but want to change, you know, fed up with daily and wanting to convert to monthly treatment, for example. We wanted to just offer it to everyone, really. They did have to convert to sublocate within a week. Um, so that would mean that a methadone patient would need to withdraw with uh, uh, a taper their daily medication, for example, from 80 milligrams. Uh, we used 30 as the threshold for conversion to sublingual buprenorphine. Our buprenorphine patients had obviously a much easier um, um, transition. Uh, the usual exclusion criteria for most of our trials in the field. So we identified uh, a fairly large number of patients across the five sites. The majority were excluded because they were their Okay, I think we've decided as we're now at uh, half past four and John, uh, who's ever the master of economy, uh, already gave this presentation, this part of it yesterday. I think we should probably stop the, the presentation and just allow, uh, with your indulgence, a few minutes for questions uh, for the speakers. So um, any questions or comments? Go ahead. There we go. Thank you so much. I'm, I'm Gavin Bark from University of Minnesota in the United States. I have a question for Professor Mann. So after describing the differences in guideline development, uh, were there many differences in the actual guideline recommendations? And if there weren't, does that inform what future processes should entail? 
Yeah, good question. There were not many, almost no differences in the recommendations, neither in the French guidelines, nor in the German guidelines, nor in the NICE guidelines. So basically, you know, uh, we're, we're, we're aiming towards a, a common, uh, a common f result. And that is one of the reasons, thanks for the question, that's one of the reasons that I think and many others think uh, we do not need to do uh, such a, a big effort uh, in each of the countries. Would you agree, Colin? I mean... Um, yeah, I mean, I think for, for addictions that's probably true, but, um, you know, you might have other drugs in other fields, like, you know, cancer treatment, where, you know, you've got uh, each each uh, course of treatment is costing $100,000, uh, where different uh, resource settings are going to have a very different view about the value of that kind of treatment, and possibly the health economic aspects are going to come into play more than they do in our field at this stage. But, uh, you know, so I, I would have thought, um, certainly uh, having done the UK guidelines and then reviewed the French ones and looked at the German ones, you know, there, there was hardly anything to, uh, to see in terms of difference between them. Uh, I'm, I'm not sure how much added value there would be now in doing, uh, you know, further root and branch kind of systematic reviews from square one, you could probably, there will be new advances will come along which might alter recommendations. You know, if a, if a breakthrough medication appeared on the market to cure cocaine addiction, for example, everybody would, you know, probably want to revise their guidelines on the basis of that. But I think there's, there's probably a lot of wasted resource in you know, doing multiple systematic reviews that are exactly the same um, systematic review question, reaching the same, <laughs> the same answer. So yeah, I, I kind of agree with that. I think Vim, you had a question? Yeah, maybe one to continue that. Uh, we just finished a, a new guideline for alcohol dependence. And one of the recommendations, and that's, that's a more general issue, do you get to the real right questions that are important because one of our recommendations is now every patient that comes for treatment for alcohol dependence should be offered medication against alcohol treatment. Is such a guideline, are such guidelines likely to appear in these guidelines that answer the questions that we already know? I mean, well, if I, if I could answer that, that was one of the recommendations that came out of the NICE guidelines. Uh, you know, not only which medications, but also the fact that every patient with reaching a certain threshold of dependence should, should receive, should be offered this. Uh, but also another, another failing of guidelines often is that they look at pharmacological treatments separately from psychotherapies and in reality you know we're going to offer both um, and possibly detoxification at some stage and rehabilitation so really I think guidelines need to move from examining individual interventions to looking at a, like a, a pathway of care where you specify somebody who has this level of dependence this level of comorbid comorbidity should expect to receive the following elements of treatment in a logical sequence and coordinated, you know, so that there's no gaps in, in between. Um, and we, we tried to do that with the NICE guidelines again. You know, we talked about pathways of care and um, uh, continuity of care as being really important because people often, as we saw from John's talk, you know, they drop out at various stages of treatment. So making sure that people actually receive the care through, you know, effective care coordination and keeping them in treatment, you know, is, is quite important. But I think a lot of guidelines don't look at that. You know, they tend to look at, you know, which medication works, which, you know, type of psychotherapy works. Maybe one question for Jürgen. Did you take into account the role of psychiatry? Because that field is changing now 
I know for the Netherlands psychiatry was not involved in any addiction treatment until 10 years ago. Now every psychiatrist gets basic training in, in addiction treatment. And so there's on the one hand is the addiction specialist, on the other hand there's the psychiatrist now getting a decent education also in, in the, and training in, in addiction. Um, there were possibilities for the countries to report that uh, addiction psychiatry was sort of a, almost a subspeciality, but it was beyond what we were able to capture within the study, the different uh, uh, course material that uh, different psychiatrists in different countries also in, in different ages, because this is a new novel co cohort of psychiatrists coming in out in the Netherlands. <clears throat> but, um, so, so the answer is basically no. <laughs> uh, um, what I would recommend though is that people read the paper, I'm not say, saying that just because it's my paper, but please react and, and write letters to European Addiction Research saying that this is wrong and this needs to be nuanced and so on. So hopefully, through such a process, we will be able to build a more comprehensive picture of the situation in Europe. Thank you. I had one for Honora, if I may. Um, yeah. Uh, it, it was just, um, obviously, it was really interesting to see the vast differences in the way OSTs delivered in the two countries that you're reviewing. Are you able to look at the outcomes uh, across the two countries? You know, it, uh, it's sometimes said that a high level of supervision is helpful in achieving good outcomes in OST, but it, it might actually have the opposite effect if people are sort of so exhausted by, you know, having to travel to a clinic miles away every day. Is this on? Oh. Thanks for the question. You know, I think it, context is so important. Uh, there are overdose data, and when we compare overdose rates, which again is just one of many outcomes, um, we know that at a population level, France's overdose rates, or excuse me, U.S. overdose rates are 30 times, 32 times that of France. Um, certainly we have fentanyl in the United States, and there's not fentanyl in Europe. Uh, at least it's not predominant. So I think there's lots of drivers, um, but even just looking at treatment engagement, which I think is a critically important measure, we're really failing in the United States, and, and when you listen to patient advocacy groups and many clinicians, really the, the barriers to treatment and the, the lack of low barrier care is, is such an enormous challenge. Um, I am, there was a recent paper out in JAMA Network that, um, Benjamin and I have discussed some um, that I think is really problematic in terms of how they frame the risks of methadone. Um, you know, methadone and, yeah, so, so that's a sort of a very short answer to an important question. Okay, thank you, that's helpful. Uh, any final points? Yeah. Not a, not, not a question, but an encouragement. Since, since Jürgen brought up the, the subject matter, it is if there are not current collaborations with the International Consortium of Universities on Drug Demand Reduction, which has almost 400 university members, uh, they too are trying to do an international global survey of addiction training and what the needs are in order to help develop uh, international curriculum for uh, training through universities. Uh, uh, so I would encourage the, the partnership. Thank you, point well taken. Okay, we're, we're a bit over time, but I'm glad that we've all stayed to the end to, to have a few questions. Uh, I'd just like to thank once again the ATHS organizers for uh, allowing us to, to have a, a UFAS symposium here and to bring together this uh, rich array of speakers that we've had this afternoon. Um, so I'd like to thank them all for their excellent contributions and thank you for, for joining us. Thank you now. Bye. <laughs>